Number 10, the chimpanzee human, also referred to as human Zs, which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work, or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way you would act. He was previously a performance animal. He was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day, which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we gonna mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the number eight. Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Kinda seems like we could use them. Number seven, woolly mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. Yep, instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago, but what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, obviously look at them. Lots of food, so they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way, they're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes, combined with the preserved mammoth DNA, is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, well, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped more than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk, and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> 
at your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattle to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together, and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian Blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep. Hi. Hybrid science. There we go. Let's get mixing. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot, this is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yeah, they're actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the Great Auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Elde Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we got a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. Keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. So. I mean, from circus to science, it's like, eh, you're still, sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There are luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Maridius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in Ice Age. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous. And best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us. We, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors. And well, the rest is history and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. There we go, hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty in the future. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
a lamel. Or a comma, you pick. That's the best part of these hybrid animals. They have two names, really, so you can choose whatever sounds the most silly. A lamel is the result of crossbreeding in Dubai. Yeah, the crown prince thought, you know what? We've made enough memories here. Let's make an animal. Why not? What could go wrong? Let's make a comma and name it Rama. And he did. He did just that. Rama the comma. It just rolls off the tongue. What could go wrong? Researchers in the United Arab Emirates artificially inseminated a camel back in 1998. They were hoping to have this brand new animal born with the wool of a llama and the temperament of a camel. Instead, they got him. This little guy. Rama is known to be moody, but you know what? To be fair, I would be moody as well if I was just born. If I was just created out of nowhere. Like, why do my knees hurt? They're like, well, those are new knees. We have never seen those knees before. So, that's why they're clicking. Number nine, mules and hinnies. So right off the bat here, a mule is already a hybrid. It's the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. And a hinny is the offspring of a male horse and a female donkey. Get it? Got it? Great. Mules have been a pretty common asset since George Washington days, fun fact. But it wasn't until 2003 until the University of Idaho cloned one. Yeah, we cloned a hybrid animal. I feel like we're flying too close to the sun here, honestly. The mule's name, well, the clone rather, was Idaho Jem. That's a fair name. He's, he's pretty well a gem, yeah. Number eight, sheep goats. I love these ones. I'm not gonna lie, they're, they're odd, but they're very cute, undeniably cute. These little miracles. It was really this one goat in Northern Germany who did this one. He saw this sheep on the other side of a fence and thought, you know what? Forget the last million years of evolution. I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna go talk to her, let's see what happens. She goes to another school, let's see what's up. I'm gonna be brave. He hopped the fence, went over, got some phone numbers, had some dates, did some dirties. The odd time this does happen, usually nothing happens long term. But when farmer Claus Ekstrenbrink saw this fling, he couldn't believe his eyes later. A sheep goat, or a geep, was born in front of his eyes, yeah, and they named it Lisa. What a lovely name. How sweet is that? Also, this list starts a little tame and then they get into some, you know, pig human stuff. So if you're saying, aw, right now, no, buckle up, it gets much worse. Starting with number seven, beefalo. Yeah, not necessarily the government, but back in the mid 1700s, thousands of ranchers, I'm talking like 6,000 ranchers, all agreed to raise hybrid beefalo. Yeah, that was the thing they were gonna change in history at that point. They're like, let's do it, and they went with beefalo. Well, they didn't really have a choice. The beefalo is a result of American bison meeting cattle. These accidental hybrids are normal. They're expected in some way, shape, or form, but cut to the late 1800s, cattle and bison were intentionally created. Yeah, Colonel Samuel Benson, guy was warden of Stony Mountain Penitentiary. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna crossbreed some animals. Yeah, take my thousands of keys. Thank you. I'm gonna go a animal life it is for me now, I guess. Guy buys eight bisons and then breeds them with Durham cattle. Yeah, what do you do on your weekends when you retire, I guess. The beefalo is a great improvement. Apparently it's a great milker. I, I don't know much about milking beefaloes or buffaloes, but Warren Samuel Benson he was your guy in the late 1800s. He would have chatted your ear off about milk and beefalo. Number five, Walfin. Well, there's a word I have never said before in my entire life. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male killer whale. Yeah, what a riot, what a pair, what a duo. These are extremely rare and they've been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. Yeah, because humans suck. The first recorded Walfin was born at the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, but he sadly died not even a year after his birth. Just two days in and it was done. Obviously, this is not working out, but the first born Walfin in the United States that miraculously somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii, and that was in 1985. And her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. She did survive. Now, the first baby passed away after a few days, and the second passed away at the age of nine, but nine years old. This is already a massive improvement from what we've seen earlier, and thankfully the third one is still living to this day. Yeah, both Kekamalu and her daughter are still alive, but they still remain in captivity. Number four, farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India figured that if they were to crossbreed their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money, which is better for everyone and their families. Now this was an ideal step, right? What could possibly go wrong? A lot of things could go wrong here. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting milky results, you know, good results. And they ended up with cattle that did produce more milk, but at the same time, these guys needed way more food or else they'd stop producing said great amounts of milk. 
They wouldn't get milky results after that point. Plus, they were less resistant to local diseases, so they required way more uh, vet visits. So yeah, they're producing more milk, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more money long term. So, AKA, not a solution. Number three, dog mixing. Oh, this one's sad too. No more fun and games, no more milk and jokes. This one's wild. But this one is also a reminder that you can't just put any type of dog together and then just see what happens. Yeah, that's, that's not gonna fly, my friends. That's not how DNA works. I got the D, didn't know how to do the N or the A, really. Back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy came in and said she just didn't want the dog anymore, wasn't feeling comfortable owning this specific dog. In fact, it didn't look like any dog she had seen in the past, which was odd considering her occupation. The dog had a shorter body, it was like stuffy almost, and its jaw was larger, and it had a massive underbite. It didn't look easy to navigate at all, this poor thing. Well, it turns out the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. This is the result of backyard breeding, just, you know, improvising on your own. Don't do that. Yeah, leave it to the people who know what they're doing, please, for the love of God. Julie ended up taking care of this dog, because she had to, because this person's like, eh, bye. And they had a great relationship, but this is not ideal. Don't do this. Number two, human pig. Yeah, of course we had to save this one for the last two. This is wild. This is some next level stuff. This is a Marvel film? Human pig? What are we doing? Scientists in California back in 2017 were up to some pretty remarkable stuff. An embryo was placed in an adult pig for around four weeks, then once scientists analyzed said embryo afterwards, they learned that the embryos not only, one, survived the process, which is a miracle in itself, but two, the human cells also remained. Uh, okay, now what? This is next level crossbreeding right here. The goal here, scientifically, was to grow human organs inside the pigs. And Juan Carlos Esbezua Belmonte successfully created pig-human hybrids at the Salk Institute lab. Yeah, can't wait till we have a pig superhero now, or pig uh, villain. Those exist too. Number one, Pizzly Bear. Yeah, we gotta finish this list off on an educational note. We always gotta remind the world that the ice everywhere is melting all the time. Yep, we're slowly melting, folks. Better believe it. And Pizzly Bears are here to warn us. Back in 2006, a Canadian hunter found a hybrid bear. They called it a Pizzly Bear or a Griller Bear because it looked like a mix of the two. But it actually was. It was a hybrid. Tests were later done in 2010 after more appeared in Alaska and northern Canada. Now, historically, polar bears branched off of grizzlies DNA-wise, but now we're at a point where they're coming back together. Why? Because everything's melting and food is becoming sparse. So now, they're going further away to find food, and in turn, they're meeting each other. And then they're, you know, doing the, doing the thing. Now they're starting to merge back together. And in turn, we get these terrifying bears. We have some human hybrids, some, some pig stuff, some, some milk talk. This list was loaded. This is a loaded pierogi full of uh, crossbreeding facts. There you go, just what you wanted to hear, I bet. Starting off this countdown, we have a Zorse. Now this is a mix between a zebra and a horse, which just, why? Scientists are out here just breeding animals that kind of have similar features just to see what will happen and what their offspring will look like, which a lot of people fear, because what if we cross the wrong thing and then create a dominant invasive species? Anyways, these animals were created after crossbreeding a male zebra with a female horse. The offspring look more like a horse than the zebra, but they still have their key identifying stripes. The first Zorse was created during the 19th century Entry by Charles Darwin. They are still around to this day, but are extremely rare. This is because Zorses are infertile. They can't reproduce on their own. So the only way we can create these animals is if scientists force breed them. In our ninth spot, we have the Zubra. Now, you might be thinking, this is a cross with some animal and a zebra. Well, that's what I thought, but I was wrong. This is a cross between domestic cattle and the European bison. Bison, bison, whatever. Zubrons were first created by Leopold Wallicki in 1847, but scientists didn't breed the first fertile Zubron until 1960. In fact, after World War I, a lot of people believed that Zubrons were going to replace domestic cattle because they were at a lower risk of developing diseases. So all throughout the 1950s and 60s, scientists were working on creating these animals in labs, which I mean any animal born in a lab always receives backlash and is subject to a number of controversies. But in the late 1980s, the experiments were shut down. Nowadays, there's only one herd left on Earth. Moving on to number eight, we have the humans with animal valves. When humans need to have a heart valve transplant, they have a couple of options. Either they can get a biological heart valve replacement or a mechanical heart valve replacement. Biological heart valve replacements are made from animal tissues, such as tissues from sheep, pigs, cows, even horses. In fact, many people walk 
walking around today are able to do so only because their hearts contain valves taken from animals. It's kind of trippy. In our seventh spot, we have Dan and Mary Gari. Dan and Mary Gari are transplant cardiologists who have managed to grow human muscle cells in pig embryos. They are now trying to grow human vasculature in pigs as well. The thing that they are worried about though is having someone's body reject the organs because it contains blood vessels from pigs. Now, how did they go about this experiment? Well, they deleted the genes in the pig embryos that they would need to develop certain tissues. Then they inject modified human cells in there. After 17 to 27 days, the embryos made muscle tissues formed entirely of human cells. Moving on to number six, we have the Leopon. A Leopon is a mix between a male leopard and a female lion. And I swear every photo of them look fake or edited. It's because Leopons have a head of a lion with its mane, but then a body of a leopard with all its spots. Like it doesn't look real at all. It looks like someone photoshopped the two animals together. But alas, they are real and low-key terrifying. They can grow to be larger than their full-grown leopard father. Like, they are massive. The first reference to the Leopon was back in the first century by Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder. But it wasn't until 1910 that someone saw one in real life out in the wild. But again, controversy with these guys is that leopards and lions don't naturally mate with each other. They are forced to breed in captivity together. In our second spot, we have monkey human embryo. I'm telling you, scientists are running too many experiments on monkeys and chimps, and I'm not fond of the idea of having monkeys and humans crossing, you know, hello, planet of the apes, no thank you. Anyways, an international team of scientists introduced human stem cells into monkey embryos and maintained these embryos in culture. Some of the embryos live for up to 19 days, but only a small minority of the ones that had human cells in them did actually survive. <laughs> 